Good morning. morning. How great that you're here today. You have a Revelation journal to get us going this morning. We're going to start a new series in the last book of the Bible. Who's who's psyched up for that? Yeah. I have friends who said, "What are you doing? Why why are you doing that?" You know, and I'm I'm very excited about traveling through the book of Revelation. And uh, there are blessings that are promised to us by studying the book of Revelation as we're going to see this morning. It is the last book of the Bible. It summarizes the work of Jesus and the hope of Jesus coming back for us. And I pray it's going to shape our church, shape all of us as we look through the book. Um, We live in a very divided world. Would you agree? Uh, It's divided everywhere. Tweets, posts, uh, news feeds, everywhere you look is going to point out the things that we disagree with and what we're against. And one of the hopes and prayers that I have as we study the book of Revelation is that that won't happen to us as we do this. Because a lot of people have ideas about what the book of Revelation is. But Jesus, when He left the earth, prayed for the unity of His church. He prayed that we would all be one. And we may not see everything exactly the same way as we study the book of Revelation because it has become a book of wild disagreement. But we're going to do our very best to focus on the main things. I want to show you four pictures about the way in which people think about the book of Revelation. One of the ways people think about the book of Revelation is that it's a crystal ball. And you look at the book of Revelation and you're going to find out what in the crystal ball is coming in the future. What future events are in there? And a lot of people have an image about the book of Revelation that it tells a crazy future. Others think of the book of Revelation as a mysterious code to be cracked. And so you've got to look at the book and figure out what means what and what symbolisms are there. And there are a lot of symbolisms. symbolisms, and, uh, But it's, you've got to crack the code to understand what the book of Revelation Revelation means. I'm not sure that's true. The third image is that it's a sci-fi book. It's the sci-fi book of the New Testament. Because of all of the metaphors and vivid imageries and the like, a lot of people think of it as a fictional book at the end of the Bible. And I don't think that's what it is either. And the last way people think about it is that it's just a book that's locked up and you can't understand what it means. And so therefore, a lot of people haven't read it or they've read it and gotten lost their way. And I don't think any of those are the right images for the book of Revelation. As we're going to see, it's really a gift to us from God to help us understand what Jesus has accomplished and what He's going to come back to accomplish in our world at the end of the age. He's going to make all things right. And Revelation is going to lead us to that. So, as we proceed in, I'm going to give a couple guidelines for us. Some, some guardrails that I hope you'll take in mind. Number one, we're going to zero in and focus on the majors in the book of Revelation and God's work at the end of human history. One of the things we can know for sure that the book ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ to make all things right. And so at the end, God wins. And we know how the story ends. And I believe Revelation was given to us so that we would know and live in light of that. And so the application for us is, as we think about how the end of human history wins, we know what the final score is going to be of the game. And so today, if there's a bad play, we don't have to sweat it because we know how it's going to work. If things don't go exactly right now, we know what God is going to do in His promise to make all things new at the end. The second thing is that the book calls for fidelity in our hearts to God. It's a book about kingdoms. The kingdoms of this world and the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And of all things, the book calls us to be faithful to Him. Our highest allegiance belongs to Jesus. And this book is going to challenge us to remain faithful to Jesus 
in our world when things aren't going exactly right or things are falling apart. And that's all just part of it. But we're going to focus on transformational truths more than timelines. And I know probably some of you have in mind that you're going to make a timeline, and I think you might. And we're going to try to help put some things together. But beyond that, we want the transformational truths. And the book of Revelation is, in one sense, about what has always been true, that God is sovereign and He rules over all of human history. And He rules over us today. Yes? He does. So it's not a secret code or hidden message, but the timeless truths of God that have blessed the church for 2,000 years. That's what we're going to give our attention to. And the last thing that I would say is we're going to really try to avoid holding our Bible in one hand, open to Revelation, and our news feed in the other hand, and trying to say, okay, what's happening in this country of the world and what's happening here and try to link them together. So much of the writing of um, eschatological literature over the last 50 years, particularly in the United States, has dom- been dominated by this approach of holding together what's happening in the news with what's happening in the book of Revelation in popular fiction and lots of writing. And we're going to be careful to look at what was a book in history that was written for these seven churches as we're going to see this morning. So, are you excited? Okay, good. Well, then let's open our journals to Revelation, or if you have your Bible, and you're going to also need your Bible as we go through this. Um, but let me say one more time. We are after the transformational truths of the book of Revelation that will unite the church for the cause of Jesus Christ. One of the great themes of the book of Revelation is the promised millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And it's a thousand years, the Bible describes, of the peaceful reign of Jesus. And Christians have been fighting over it for hundreds of years. And we're going to be careful not to fight over the things that are in the book of Revelation. And whether there are things that we might not see exactly the same way, we're going to grab onto the transformational truths that call us to live in a certain way. So, Revelation chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to Him to show to His servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending His angel to His servant John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Now these opening verses describe the revelation. If I were circling in my Bible, I'd just circle the word revelation. It's a revelation. That is the Greek word apocalypsis. From which we get our word apocalypse. And it simply means an uncovering or an unveiling. The unveiling of Jesus Christ. The uncovering. It's the Greek word apocalypsis. Now, what has happened over time is that word apocalypse has taken on its own genre of all kinds of um, dystopian, end of the age, cataclysmic ideas. Movies are made about the apocalypse. But the real Greek sense of the word is that the book of Revelation is a revelation, an unveiling of Jesus Christ. By the way, it's revelation, not revelations. It is His revelation to us. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ. And He is the one who is the Lamb. He is the Lamb who was slain. He is the overcomer. He's one with majesty, he's the king, and he is giving this revelation to John. You Notice in this verse that God gave it to Jesus. And so you're going to see a progression of the revelation which God gave to him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel. And so you see that God gave it to Jesus. Jesus gave it to his angels. His angels mediated it to John, and John is giving it to all of his readers, 
and through that to all of us. So there is a progress of the revelation of God, the unfolding of God's revealing of Himself. It is the uncovering of what God is doing to accomplish His purposes in the world. And we're glad to know that God is a revealer. He doesn't want us to be in the dark about His plan and about who He is and about what He's doing in the world. It will reveal the glorified Christ. It's going to tell us things about angels, about demons, about kingdoms, about judgments, about things that are coming, but it's going to unfold all that God wants us to know. In a sense, the revelation of Jesus Christ is an unveiling of how things are in heaven so that we on earth can know it. God intended for us to see how He is working out His plan in the world. You'll notice the very last phrase of verse 2 Uh, I'm sorry, verse 1 says the things that must soon take place. Soon take place. Now, this was written about 95 AD, probably by John the Apostle. That's what we think. The writer of the Gospel of John and the three letters to John. John was exiled to Patmos, and God put him there in order to receive this revelation from God. And it was written in a historical context. And yet he said, I'm writing these things from a revelation from Jesus that God gave to him and it came through angels about the things that must soon take place. How many years ago was that? It's more than 2,000 years ago. So how do we say it must soon take place? Well, we're going to see this theme again and again even in the next verse that comes of of how much um, the Bible portrays that the coming of Jesus and the culmination of human history is about to take place. Now let's look at the blessing. Verse 3. Verse 3, if you're circling, I would circle the opening word. Verse 3 says, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. You'd be blessed if you read it out loud. And blessed are those who hear it and those who keep what is written in it. Again, Everybody? For the time is near. There's a couple of things I want to note here. Blessed, we're going to come back to that, but the book of Revelation begins and ends and is thoroughly saturated with six or seven blessings for the readers of the book of Revelation. So we're going to anticipate that God's going to do that in our lives. Who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. So the book of Revelation is an uncovering of God's plan. And it is a prophetic word of things that are yet to occur. So when you think about the book of Revelation, it is an unfolding, and it is a predictive book of things that are going to happen. It is prophecy that's going to be unfolded. So I believe that the reason it's portrayed as an uncovering and a prophetic word is to create in our hearts anticipation and hope and a longing for the things that God promises are going to happen and to shape our lives in between the comings of Jesus. It is the last book of the Bible predicting the return of Jesus and the New Testament is the unfolding of the first coming of Jesus. And I believe Revelation is is designed to help us live in between these two comings of Jesus. Blessed are those who hear. There's a promise for us that by hearing the Word of God, listening to it, and keeping it, there is great blessing for us. So each week we're going to listen to the words that we're going to read and we're going to say, well, what's the blessing in that? And we're going to try to figure out what is God asking us to do in response to what it is we're seeing in the book of Revelation. Today I hope you'll begin to get a picture of the exalted Jesus Christ that we're going to see here. What I want you to see is there's prophetic word and a promised blessing. Now verse 4 says, John to the seven churches that are in Asia. 
John is the author to the seven churches that are in Asia. And that means that this book was written in a historical context. It's not science fiction. It was literally written to churches that would have received this letter and sent it around as a circular epistle from John that would have been read in their churches. And do you think that when they read it, they would have understood it? I do. I think they would have read it and they would have known what some of the imagery in the book of Revelation, which at times is complex, they would have made an imaginative link between the words that John recorded in Revelation to their own scene because it is a historical letter to the seven churches that are in Asia. And so it is a revelation and it's prophecy and it's a historical book for us. He says this greeting, grace and peace to you. Two more beautiful words are not found that God would give His grace and He would give His peace. From Him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before His throne. And from Jesus Christ. Now if you're paying attention in your journal, this is where I would say, let, let's take note of who our great God is. You have here a picture of our triune God by He who was and is and is to come. The timeless, eternal God our Father. And John writes, may you have grace and peace from God who was, is, and is to come. Who always is. There's never a time when God was not. That's the reference to our Father. And from the seven spirits who are before the throne. Most all commentators believe that this is a reference to the Holy Spirit. And seven is going to be a very important number as we travel through the book of Revelation. It's going to be a picture of what is complete. And somehow John looks and sees and imagines that there is God who was and is and is to come. And then there are seven spirits who are before His throne, which is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And we know this sense that, that, and from Jesus Christ, and then Jesus Christ is described. So, in this revelation, John first sees the throne room of God with God the Father and the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ. When you think of the seven spirits who are before his throne, this is language that is. Um, unlike what was described earlier in the Gospels about the Holy Spirit, the singular Holy Spirit, but there's a picture of the complete ministry of the Holy Spirit. This is language that we might actually say is a bit apocalyptic language. It's language that is of imagery and visions, of an image of the Holy Spirit. And the book of Revelation is apocalyptic. It's connected to these images and symbols and metaphors that are described throughout the book. And, and so it's going to be a bit apocalyptic as well. But I want you to see the way in which the revelation of Jesus Christ describes Him. And if I were circling in my journal, I would look at the three phrases about Jesus at the end of verse 5. Jesus Christ, everybody, the, the faithful witness. The true witness. It's the way John describes Jesus as speaking the truth and always being faithful to what His Father asked Him to do. Everything that Jesus is going to ascribe and teach in the book of Revelation is true. And He's the firstborn of the dead. Again, this is another phrase that we have seen in other of the letters of the apostles in the New Testament that Jesus is the first one who was who died, was buried, and rose again, and never died again. There were other resurrections, but He's the firstborn. He's the preeminent one who died and rose again, and He is going to lead all of those who are raised for eternal life. 
He's the firstborn of the dead, looking back to His first coming and His first work. And He's the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is Jesus the King. He is our great King. And if you're looking in your journal, let's say, what are going to be the titles of Jesus that are going to awaken in my heart a, a worship? He is the faithful one, the true one. He is the firstborn from among the dead. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth. All of the earth is going to be under His sovereign control one day. Well, it is now. Would you agree? It is now, but it doesn't feel like it all the time. And our world is crazy, but He is going to be the ruler of all the kings of the earth. And that's how we're going to travel through the book of Revelation. This is a beautiful picture of Jesus as He is. Okay, any questions? Let me show you, let me, let me summarize some of the things that I've said with this slide. Because we're talking about a book of Revelation that has ways of reading it that are going to help us as we travel through. Number one, it's, it is Revelation. It is God unfolding His Word to us. He's going to unfold it so that we know it. It is a disclosure of that which otherwise would not be known. Secondly, it's prophecy. It's going to be predictive about the future. It's going to foretell what God desires and tell forth what God wants said. That's the idea of prophecy. And thirdly, it's apocalyptic. And again, by apocalyptic, we mean that it is, uh, it describes earthly events with heavenly language, or it describes things that are going on in heaven with human language. So there will be visionary experiences, vivid symbolism, metaphor, description of things that we don't normally hear because it's apocalyptic and it's going to grab our attention. We're going to scratch our head and say, what does that exactly mean? Because it's apocalyptic. But then the fourth category of the way we should think about the book of Revelation is that it actually was a letter like one of the epistles of the New Testament that were written to a specific group of people, the seven churches in Asia Minor, and they would have received it and read it out loud. And they would have read the book of Revelation and it would have had meaning to them as they understood these symbolisms to relate to their world in the first century around the Roman Empire. And so I think when they read it, they were listening to the things of the book of Revelation thinking, Oh, I get some of the connections to the Roman Empire. But for the last 40 or 50 years, every one of us in the United States who have been around uh, this eschatological, geeky stuff, we say, oh, it's about the United States. It's about the United States. And, you know, the United States wasn't probably in John's mind when he wrote this and when he gathered this. And we have a tendency to be very uh, self-centered. You know, it's about us. And I want us to... Be encouraged as we read through the book of Revelation, we're going to be thinking about it as a genre of writing that is historical, apocalyptic, prophetic, and God unfolding. This is my will for the world coming. So there are some categories that we may have locked in on over time, over the last 30 or 40 years, that we may have to just say, okay, I'm going to hold that lightly and I'm going to travel through and say, God, would you help me to see what it is you have written here? to a real church in real time that was accessible and understandable to them, Lord, will You make it understandable to us. Okay? Alright. John continues at the end of verse 5, 6, and 7. Speaking of Jesus, which we've already said, He's the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of earth. To Him who... Everybody... Alright, so we're going to get a glimpse back to the first coming of Jesus. He loves us. God so loved the world that He gave His Son. Jesus Christ came into the world. Jesus loves us and He freed us from our sins by His blood. It does make perfect sense that the foundation of the book of Revelation is the first coming of Jesus. And when Jesus came into the world at first... You remember his opening words? Repent what? 
The kingdom of God is at hand. The king has come. But he didn't become king in the way he will become king. The first work of Jesus was to come because of his love for us and to free us from our sins through the sacrifice of his life on the cross, but then to make a, another theme in the book of Revelation, a kingdom. The kingdom of God has been inaugurated, but it's not consummated yet. But Jesus established a kingdom through His death on the cross and through the sacrifice. So before we get going too much further, do you know the King who came in the Gospels? He was a humble King. He was a servant King. He went to the cross to forgive us of our sins and to make us a kingdom. Even priests to His God and Father. We are ones who now as our primary mission as people who know Jesus is to worship Him, to give Him praise, to serve Him as priests serve. Do you know you're a priest to God? You have been made priests. What does a priest do? A priest renders service and worship and prayer to our Father who is in heaven. This is the work of Jesus' first coming. And... Boy, the book of Revelation is going to continually remind us, oh, this is who we are. This is who we are. Our world is confused about identity, right? And we have, it's just crazy how confused the world is. And by the way, I, I would say, I would say, as I've been preparing for this, the Lord is coming before we're going to finish this series. And I just think the world is ready for the Lord's return. The Lord, the time is near. The time is at hand. I would hasten to add that probably every generation of Christians from the first century till now have said, it's got to be our day. It's going to be now. And in fact, all of the New Testament writers wrote that. The book of Romans ends with Paul saying, God will soon crush Satan under your feet. Paul believed it was coming. James said, the Lord is near. The judge is standing at the door. Peter said, the time is near. Everybody thought it would be their day. And probably through all of history, they thought it would be their day. And so, I don't care if I think today it might be our day. I think that would be in keeping with all of the apostolic leaders who came before us that we actually live believing Jesus could come before I finish this sermon and everybody would say, yeah, you would. You'd say amen. He could come today. He made us a kingdom, priest to our God and Father. To Him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. He's coming. He's going to be the King. Behold, He's coming with the clouds. What do clouds make you think of? When did clouds accompany the glorious presence of God? Okay, one of the things I would say is as we look through the book of Revelation, you have to begin to think as an Old Testament scholar. And every time you see certain images in Revelation, they are going to have a link to the Old Testament that we have to try to make the connection to. So there will be times that we're going to be looking back at images of apocalyptic language and say, oh, that reminds me of Daniel. Daniel chapter 7. Isaiah is going to lead us backwards. And when he comes with the clouds, it ought to make us think of the Shekinah glory of God when He was present in the Old Testament in the pillar of clouds where the glory of God was and He led His people where He wanted them. When Jesus comes the second time, He's going to come with great glory, in great majesty, in in splendor of the clouds. And every eye will see Him. It will be a universal coming. When He came the first time, did everybody see Him? You know, He came in obscurity. He came to a little town of Bethlehem. And very few people saw Him. And very few people recognized Him. 
But when He comes again, He's going to come again and every eye will see Him. Even those who pierced Him. Those who know they were responsible for His death or who have rejected Him throughout their lifetime and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of Him. This is a foreshadowing that the book of Revelation is going to tell us that at the end of the age it will both be glorious in His return and it will be fierce in His judgment when He comes. And it is calling us to respond to the One who is faithful and true. There is judgment in the book of Revelation. And there is delivery. Even so, Amen. Now the last verse is a word about God. Verse 8 says, there it is, I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord God, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. There it is. It's a picture of God. Alpha and Omega is the first and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It is a picture of all of the things that could ever be said all of the knowledge that could ever be contained in any word and all writing, that God is that. He is perfect in every way. He is complete knowledge, perfect knowledge. Who is and who was and who is to come. He's everywhere present, nowhere confined in any way by time or by space. He is sovereign over all of history. He is the Almighty because He is perfect in power and nothing can stop Him. This is the sort of the announcement that when God who knows everything and is unbound by time and has no limitations of His power is going to wrap up human history, it is coming. He's the Alpha and Omega and everybody said. Yeah, it's true. Now let's go back to the blessing. Verse 3. Here's the blessing of verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy and blessed are all who hear and all who keep what is written. I want our church to be blessed for the next 18 or 19 weeks. That's where we're going. Okay, we're going to do Christmas Eve with the second coming of Jesus. How about that? We're going to celebrate Christmas with the second coming. So that's where we're going. And I want you to be blessed. I want your heart to really be drawn in to know and love Jesus with all of your heart. This is a revelation about who He is. Who is He? He's the faithful and true witness. He's the King over all the earth. He's the wounded, slain Lamb who is standing at the right hand of God. He's the coming King and the Judge. And I want you to be blessed by listening to the book of Revelation and keeping it. That's how Revelation begins. Revelation 1-3. Let's just take a look at the last part of the book. You can look in your journal to 22. Revelation 22, verse 7, here's how the book ends. I behold Him coming soon. Woo! There it is. Soon. It's been 2,000 years. But I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of this prophecy of this book. You'll be blessed. I want you to be blessed. So what would it mean for us in 2023 to keep the words of the book of Revelation. Let me suggest three things. Number one, I would suggest that the way we might keep this is to, as we read over the next 18 weeks, to be ready in holiness in our own life. I think the book of Revelation is designed to draw us in to see Jesus as He really is and how He's coming back again to be ready for His return. And that is to be holy as He is holy. When John wrote 1 John chapter 3, he said, you remember how great a love the Father has shown to us that we should be called the children of God. And that's what we are. For this reason the world doesn't know us because it didn't know Him. Beloved, we are God's children. Now. And what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him that He's going to come again, purifies Himself even as He is pure. One of the anticipatory responses 
of believing Jesus could come soon is to be ready personally. So, I think the blessing for Calvary will be as we study the book of Revelation to keep ourselves ready for His return. We could see Him at any time. So let's be ready. Number two, because He could come at any time, we need to be hopeful. Waiting in confident hope that He's going to make all things right. The world is discouraging. We're surrounded by, by discouragement and division and depressing news. That Jesus coming is going to make all things right. So, do you have hope? Hope that keeps you going through whatever it is you're in the midst of right now. We wait for our Son from heaven and we trust in the God of hope. And lastly, I would want us to be witnessing people. If this is the true, the way the world is going to end and there will be judgment and there is a time fixed for judgment and blessing and entrance into an eternal state, well, then the Gospel is still the good news that all the world needs to hear. So how do we live between the comings of Jesus? We want to be holy and hopeful and sharing the good news of Jesus Christ everywhere that we can. There's just too many verses in the Bible, but in 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes about people mocking the end of the age. And they say, the time's going to come where people are going to say, well, where's the, where's the promise of Jesus coming? Since the beginning, you know, He said He was coming and He's not back yet. Have you ever felt that? I think a lot of the people in the world say, well, Jesus is not going to return. 2 Peter chapter 3 says, people scoff that the end of the age is going to be that way. Where's the promise of His coming? But 2 Peter 3, 8 says, do not overlook this one fact. That with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slow concerning His promise, as some count slowness. But He is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We have time now before the Lord returns. And I think what the Lord wants us to do to experience the blessing of the book of Revelation is to keep what it says and to let it shape our hearts to be holy and to be hopeful and to let the Gospel be on our lips to rescue some before He comes. Okay, verse 8, we close. I am the Alpha and Omega, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come. He's the Almighty. Let's worship Him. Let's pray together. God, open our hearts to this truth in the book of Revelation. Your promise to come and make all things right. You who are the first and the last, the Alpha and Omega, the faithful witness, the Lamb who was slain, the King of all the other kings of the earth. We know who You are and that You are coming. Will You awaken our hearts to experiencing the blessing of the book of Revelation? to keep Your Word, to be shaped by Your promised return, to be hopeful, to be holy, and to be Gospel sharing. We pray that many will come to faith through Jesus Christ in the next several months as we study Your Word. And may Your blessing come to us. We say to You, all hail to our King Jesus. You are worthy of our allegiance and our worship. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.